So let's talk in a, a bit more detail about the role of the non-executive director. Uh, for most firms, do you agree that the standard formula is the most appropriate way to calculate the, the solvency capital requirement, the SCR? Yes, we do. We're going to have about 450 um, authorised firms following the standard formula, so it's uh, well over 90% of the, the market as a whole. Uh, and for those firms, that it will be the appropriate way to calculate their, their capital requirement. Um, but it's for the firms themselves to judge whether or not that is capturing all the risks and the own risk and solvency assessment is actually an important overlay on top of the standard formula. Yes, and we'll talk about that in a moment, I think. If a, if a board decides that the standard formula is not appropriate for the firm and it either is going to go down an internal model or a partial model route, what are the specific actions it should be looking to take? Well, first of all, they should be talking to the supervisor. That's, uh, it will be um, something of a joint decision because we will be advising them on whether or not we think their risks are properly captured mm -hmm. by the standard formula. But there's a range of things they can undertake um, which go from having a standard formula out of the box through to an internal model. So the first thing they could do, for example, is what they call a USP, undertaking specific parameter, which uh, un under certain conditions allows them to change the standard formula somewhat to more properly reflect the risks. Okay. The next stage would be a partial internal model where they model some of the risks which aren't properly dealt with in the standard formula. That's another option. And then you can go the whole hog through to a full uh, internal model, which of course is the most complex way to do it. Now over and above that, we do have some uh, restricted ability to apply capital add-ons if necessary. And so for some firms, standard formula initially with a capital add-on might be the appropriate way to go. So there's a range of choices. It's not a, just a, a strict binary choice between standard formula and internal model. And the firm should be discussing which is the most appropriate thing to do with their supervisors. And presumably now they, they can't afford to delay this decision. Oh yes, ab absolutely. A, a but the regime is meant to be dynamic. It is meant to change as people's risk profiles change. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as if every firm that needs an internal model will be on an internal model from 1st of January, for example. We're expecting about a third of the firms that are on internal models to come with our applications during 2016 rather than this year. Yeah. So it's quite all right for a firm to start on the standard model and then to bring us their internal model uh, for approval once they've got it in, in a fit shape. So the 1st of January really in that sense is is the beginning point for firms to use internal model, not necessarily a deadline that they have to That's right. From. But from that point on, they have to match either the standard formula or one of the various models um, consistent with the Solvency 2 directive. Okay. And in the PRA's view, what, what are the core risk areas for a firm where you just would take the view that a standard formula is not likely to be appropriate? Well, it differs a bit between GI and life, as everything insurance always <laughs> does. Um, so on the GI side, for example, you wouldn't want to have your cap risk modelled by the, the standard formula, just to give you one example. Mm -hmm. um, on the life side, if you've got a portfolio of equity investments, you wouldn't want that captured by the standard formula. And so there's a range of risks like that on, on either side, which where you'd want to go to a, an internal model approach. Okay. And uh, for firms considering an internal model, what would be the most important things that non-executive directors should be considering at the outset? The, it is, they play a crucial role in assessing the validity of the internal model. Um, they don't have to do it on their own. They can use external advice. They can uh, rely on some of the work done by the executive. They can rely on a certain amount of commentary and feedback from the regulator. Um, but they do have to take the overall responsibility for the model. Mm. Um, but they don't have to be experts in modelling um, per se. What you need to be able to do is know what the risks and limitations of the models are. Um, and that's probably best done through sensitivity analysis. Um, what you need to know is what are the key assumptions in the model. If you change those key assumptions, which ones really drive the outputs? Um, you also need to know where does the model work well, where does it not work well? And that should be possible to come to those sorts of judgments without being a deep technical expert on the actual modelling processes. You don't have to know about gas and copulas in order to be able to understand the basic properties of the model. So you need to be able to understand what the model is telling you, but not necessarily be able to write a model yourself. That's right. And, and we do expect the boards to be a range of experience, people with experience, some within insurance, some from outside insurance. Mm. Some from within the insurance industry may have some actuarial experience. So you expect to see that range of skills brought to bear uh, in order to challenge the internal model and make sure it's fit for purpose. 
because it is a key area, isn't it, that non-executives worry about, you know, are they expected to reach a judgment here on something which they're technically less competent to understand than a, than a trained actuary, for example? I think it's right. I think that, that people swing between the two extremes. There's one thinking they have to be able to second guess all the work of their actuaries. That's not what we're saying. A board full of actuaries would not be a great board for <laughs> a commercial firm. But at the same time, they can't just take at face value everything that's put mm. in front of them. Mm. They're the ones that have to assess that this is a model which captures the risk in their business. Uh, and it's crucial they understand their business and that the model fits it. And the model is actually meant to be used to run the business. It's meant to direct where the capital goes and keep in pace with the changes in the approach to managing the business overall. Okay. You mentioned earlier the uh, own risk insolvency assessment, the ORSA. Why is the ORSA so important in Solvency 2? ORSA is really the assessment of risk for the management of the firm. It's not a report for the regulator. Okay. It's meant to capture every risk within the business. So even if you're on a standard formula, and the standard formula covers some things well, some things less well, ORSA should capture everything. And the ORSA is not meant to be a good news story. It should contain within it an assessment of where the risks are not captured well. Um, what the firm is doing to try and mitigate those risks. In this crucial document, a new NED going into a firm for the first time should be able to look at the ORSA, understand the business, understand the, the approach, know where the risks in the firm lie. So it's absolutely a key issue for running the firm, not just part of the regulatory requirement. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's probably something that not everyone fully understands. It's really a document primarily for the board then, rather than for the PRA. It is, and if I said where is it not being done very well, because we've actually received 300 authors uh, already to, to review. It's that not quite appreciation of the role of the author in running of the firm. We need the board to engage with it. It's meant to be this holistic picture of risk within the firm, mm. and the board needs to understand that, grasp it, uh, and get to grips with what the author is telling them. So where do you think then that NEDs can add most value in helping drive and formulate good authors? Well, the NEDs, we hope, are drawn from a wide range of backgrounds and bring a wide range of skills to the management of the, of the firm. Um, they need to use those skills in, in challenging, in assessing, and actually sometimes somebody with a completely fresh view on things will be the most effective person at, at challenging uh, and making sure that the, whatever they're doing under Solvency 2, whether it's the standard form or the model, is fit for purpose. And presumably, as well, a role in trying to see how, make sure that the also is more firmly embedded in the business. It's not just a document exactly that sits on right. the board table. Exactly right. They're the ones who should be using it. Um, it's no, not just for executive management. It's not for the regulator. It's really for the board as a whole to oversee the business. Okay. So the the also is obviously part of the the system of governance. I mean, more broadly, are the governance requirements uh, for a board under Solvency to radically different from the current way of doing things? Not really. That we think they're very much in line with the expectations that we have had uh, up until now. Of course, not every firm will meet our expectations currently, and we'll be in dialogue with those firms where they need to improve their governance. It's something very much at the top of the PRA's agenda for both insurance and, and banking. But the principles underlying Solvency 2 are not so different. There are a few things at the margin which are different. For example, the prudent person principle when it comes to making investments and there are stricter rules around the outsourcing uh, within firms. But by and large we think it's, it's pretty consistent. So for a, a long-standing non-executive director wanting to know how to adjust their, their, their behaviours and their focus, the prudent person principle, the outsourcing are two areas that they should make sure I think they're so. aware of. Those are things which are slightly different. I don't think they should be completely different to um, the way the firms should always have been thinking about those things, but they are now requirements rather than opposed to just good practice. Okay. So uh, to pull some of this together for, for non-executive directors, taking stock of their responsibilities and how best to respond to solvency to in a nutshell, what would you sort of say to them that, that yeah, the core principles that if they don't deviate from, they can't go too far wrong? I think they have to remember the responsibility they now have under Solvency 2 um, and try and, and get that right. It's not about displacing management, uh, not about um, uh, acting on behalf of the regulator, it's about managing uh, the business, overseeing the business. Um, and to remember that they are a team. It's not about individual responsibility, this is responsibility placed on the board. Uh, they are part of that board. They need to work together. They need to draw on the different skills within the, the NEDs on each, on each firm uh, and use those skills to the best advantage. 
So it's very much a collective enterprise, not something that each NED should be thinking they have to do on their own. Exactly. We don't want identical NEDs, and that's not the intention. And as I say, that would not be a good outcome. Okay. Thank you.